Welcome to China Manufacturing Decoded from Sophieast, the podcast where we take you through some of the major topics facing importers and manufacturers in China today. Hi there, you're listening to episode 16 of the podcast. This episode is episode five in our series about vetting new Chinese suppliers. Previously, we've spoken about some of the trouble you can get into if you select the wrong Chinese supplier, and we've also started going in depth into some of the ways that you can start assessing potential suppliers from your office in the West or wherever you are in the world, and then progressing to what happens when you actually go and visit a supplier yourself. What should you be looking for? What questions should you be asking? Now, in this episode, we're talking about factory audits specifically focused on quality these second party factory audits are a way to formalize what you're looking at in a supplier so Renault's going to take us through what factory audits are in a lot more detail here and why they're a very very useful tool for importers who are sourcing new suppliers in China hello Renault how are you doing today hey great great the um... Typhoon of last week and all the rain has gone and starting to be hot again here. So, um, okay, so you got some summery weather back. Yeah, um, summery, yeah, South China kind of weather. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, not, not, not the best in the summer. <laughs> sure, How about you? a little, little bit warm. <laughs> Well, unbelievably, here in the UK, it's been it's been really nice. Yeah, hmm. uh, aside from the pandemic, of course. I think uh, it would be nice to be able to go to China, which of course a lot of people can't at the moment. Don't be too hopeful, yeah. Well, talking about going to China, today's podcast topic is quite relevant to that, and this is going to be part five of our series on vetting Chinese suppliers. I'll add some links to the earlier parts of the series in the show notes. In this one, we're actually talking about on-site factory quality audits and the relevance to, you know, importers and people that are buying stuff from Chinese suppliers and the inability to actually travel to China. Perhaps this will become a little bit clearer later on as you're as you're going into this topic. If we're, if we're looking at a factory audit or a factory quality audit. I guess a good starting point is to start off with a kind of a summary about what this kind of thing is. Sure. Basically, um, you know, an auditor can go to a factory, and I'm I, okay. F- first, I should make the distinction. There's there's first party, second party, third party audit. Um, mm. First party is basically internal audit when. You know, we set up, maybe we ask someone from the quality department to audit the practices of the purchasing department and of the production department, and, you know, all within the same company. Um, very healthy. Uh, it's a very common form of, um, you know, good management, let's say. Uh, but that, that's not really what we, we're going to talk about here. Uh, mm. Second part to audit is when the buyer or a potential buyer is selling someone to their potential supplier or their established supplier uh, and, and, and check how, how they're doing things. And third party audit is when, for example, in, in our company, we, um, we are certified by the British Standard Institu- Institution, BSI, as compliant with ISO 9001 2015 version. And that requires us to be audited and that's a third party audit by the BSI on our company. So they, um, they come and they, um, it's, it's, it's quite formal and they, you know, they, mm. they, um, their only job is to establish whether a compliance, uh, whether we are compliant or not. And uh, they, they really have very strict guidelines and everything. Okay, uh, when, with a second party audit, which is what we're going to talk about today, it's much, much more flexible, okay? It's just okay. The, 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 the buyer just wants to know, um, you know, for example, if it's a, an audit of their quality, um, quality systems, well, it's, you know, everything that can impact, um, you know, product quality for, for the buyer, right? And it, it can really follow closely ISO 9001, but in most cases, it veers away from that and, and, and people have their own um, sort of checklist and, uh, you know, list of 
areas of interest, right? But it could also be on many other topics. It could be on environmental, um, you know, practices like, uh, are you environmentally friendly? Do you have a system for that? Uh, do you, you know, what, what, you know, do you do this and this and this and this to be environmentally friendly? You know, how do you dispose of this 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 type of polluting materials and mm. and uh, when you purchase do you do this and it's okay it could be on many other things social compliance obviously um there's a lot of auditing uh, a lot of audits on, of, of factories in asia for social compliance mm. uh, actually in the uk uh, i guess you, you read about that there's um that like kind of a scandal these days in uh, the lifestyle area with modern slavery so there's there's um there's, there's a lot of social compliance audits in the UK these days. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. It, basically, um, anytime companies, brands are sort of worried about what happens in their supply chain, they will look at these kind of things. Um, it could be allegations of, I don't know, child labor in Pakistan, of uh, maybe forced labor in some parts of China. That's, you know, a lot of people are talking about that these days. Uh, mm. It could be very wide. It could, it could be on other topics, you know, information security, um, a lot of other things, right? So um, that's, you know, a factory audit basically is typically someone going there with a checklist or at least a, a list of topics to, to look at and was going to ask some questions and observe and try not to be taken for a ride because that's <laughs> um, so always something, um, you know, to, to be careful about. Um, and, and, uh, and who, who will have, you know, a report or at least some observations of, you know, what, what's the level of compliance or, or what is the level of risk? It's, it's usually expressed as one of these two ways. And again, there's, so many flavors of these different companies, you know, have different approaches, uh, which which makes sense. And um, and these days, a lot of buyers, uh, you know, who used to travel to China and were walking in in their main uh, manufacturers' facilities and were observing a lot of things. Um, these days, cannot travel, so they have to resort mm. to you know service providers and service providers. Um, you know, they can say, okay, I'm going to just go there, walk along and, you know, give you some observations. Uh, but that's quite unstructured and, and the buyer doesn't really know what he's going to get. Whereas a, um, a good old traditional factory audit, which is a very, very common type of, um, of, of service here. Uh, and I mean, not, not just here, pretty much all over the world. Um, let's say it has more predictable results, but it's really a different approach. It's more formal. It can be more stressful for the suppliers. You know, mm. it's, you, you get less subjectivity. Let's say if you send the same auditor, or let's say, sorry, two different auditors to the same factory, you should get more or less the same observation. Okay, these are the main gaps, let's say in their systems. So you get more objectivity, more repeatability. Um, but you you lose some of the the, the subjective sort of feelings uh, that 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 we discussed in a, a very recent uh, post podcast episode. Um, sure. There's also some value to that. Yeah. yeah so logically, we're we're now starting to really formalise the the vetting process by conducting such an audit, which is going to have quite a structured methodology which is governed by standards like as you mentioned ISO 9001 right so ISO 9001 let's let's <laughs> let's be careful so let, let let's say you um you're a buyer and you are in touch with a potential supplier and you don't want any nasty surprises you want mm -hmm. to make sure that they have the quality systems to actually do what they promise to do right which is basically what a no, quality is all about, right? Um, so you, you, you're going to focus on, 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 on their you know, quality assurance, let's say. Um, um, you, you could say, let's do it strictly based on ISO 9001, which is a set of requirements that is written in a way that is applicable to a small restaurant, <laughs> um, a, you know, 
uh, factory making socks uh, and factory making um, uh, PCBA, uh, you know, uh, a, um, all kinds of organizations, you know, it could be a church, it could be really all kinds of organization, right? Mm. Uh, it could be a sports team. I mean, you know, there's, there's it's pretty much no limit. So it's written in a way that's extremely generic. And there's, there's a lot of things that when you go into a manufacturing site to check for quality, um, to check the quality systems, there's a lot of things that uh, could be written in a more, much more specific way uh, that could go much deeper. So it, it's generally not what I would advise doing. If, if, um, if you're about to work with a manufacturer, you wanna, you, 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 again, you want to make sure they're reliable, right? That they, uh, they can do what they, got, they say they're gonna do at the, you know, uh, and, and respect your quality standard and, and do it in a systematic way repeatable way with low risk uh, and that they have some all the basic management systems behind that and they're doing the right practices every day and and so on and so forth um it's i i would not just go blindly with iso 9001 i i um i, I yeah there's certain points where i would try to go deep and a lot of things i would not uh, not check because an auditor typically is is there for you know a day, and you don't want the auditor to spend a lot of time on things like hey you know show me your management review and I want to make sure that you really do this blah 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 you know uh, mm -hmm. on, on on documents and show me your internal audits and show me your you know all the underlying things uh, if you're gonna have an auditor spend just one day there. I would skip all that. I would go directly for the, the practices. Mm, okay, that's that's good advice. Now you mentioned the quality system a, a few times, and of course, when we're looking at reliability of our supplier in China, the quality that they're going to eventually put out is you know really important aspect of that. You've written before that few Chinese factories actually have what you would call a solid quality system. So can you tell me a little bit more about this? <laughs> There's a few of the, you know, that 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 old book by Sun Tzu, the, the 36 stratagems, and right. the art of war, and all these kind of things, right? So he he made a list of 36 stratagems, and this is really a classic in uh, in Chinese culture, and and most Chinese business people have read it, and you know they nod their heads, and yeah, 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 right. And some of them are funny. I mean. If you know, cross the sea without the emperor's knowledge, that that's that's one that's fun. Uh, don't you know? Just do things behind their back and don't tell them. And if you make a mistake, you know, just just try to uh, to hide it be behind sm smokes and mirrors and try to 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 uh, to bring the attention to something else. Um, you know, another one is besiege way to rescue Zhao. Um, you know, so if they say that you know, doing good on quality, then you have to hint that prices will go up if they are too too tough in that, that respect. I mean, th there's a lot of little things like this um, that still permeate, let's say the old style Chinese culture. Now things are changing in China, uh, mm. but this is still uh, the way that a lot of senior managers think in a lot of manufacturing um, facilities. And this is directly incompatible with, uh, um, with the ISO 9001 uh, basic principles, for example, with uh, the ASQ code of ethics, with you know everything that we think as basic principles uh, of mm. good quality management professionals, right? So, and, and, and that at the core is really eroding a lot of the, um, um, the efforts maybe that some factories would, would like to put into uh, setting up a good quality management system. If you don't change the way people think, well, you know, and if you don't create a culture that really supports some of these good principles, everything else would be so much harder, right? Um, so that's, um, that's something I sometimes remind 
foreign uh, foreign buyers about. They, they, they tend not to have the context about uh, classic Chinese culture. Mm. Um, you know, and it's fun. I mean, when you when you read some of these old Sun Tzu uh, advice, uh, you know, they, sometimes you're like, oh yeah. I'm sure that that supplier read it because that's what they pulled on me. <laughs> it's funny. That's that's amazing that something you know thousands of years old still has an effect on the way that some people are doing business in China today. I guess the yes. I guess the auditor can sort of cut through a lot of this noise though for you, can't they? The auditor again depends on their checklist. If you if you mm. ask them to do a lot of work on the documents, well, the documents can be faked easily. And uh, it, it can be hard for the auditor to really trace things back and and actually look at something physical, right? So um, if if the checklist asks him to actually look at the practices and not really care about what people say they do, but see if you know what they do first, and then see if you know it's kind of consistent with what we are, they are said to do. Um, mm-hmm. And they always ask for examples, and they pick things themselves, and they say, "Show me for this, you know, what are the." Um, you know, the, the, give me, you know, let's do a uh, backward traceability exercise and, and show me the record for this because you, you, you told me you, 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 you have this control here. Um, you know, show me how you do it and, you know, how, how can I be sure that you really do it and these kind of things. Um, yeah, it really cuts through all the, um, the BS basically. Um, mm. That's a lot of Chinese manufacturers tend to put up. Now, not all of them, of course. Again, some of them have good positive cultures, but a lot of them, when they hear audit, you know, an auditor is coming and they've already gone through 10, 20 audits. They know what to say, what not to say. They know the kind of documents that impress an auditor where the auditor sees it and says, oh, okay, 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 okay. Like, I'm not gonna go deeper into this. I see you have you have all set up, you know, uh, versus, when this is something and the auditor says, oh, really, tell me more. Oh, and uh, what about this? Oh, can you show me an example of that? And the auditor smells a rat. You know, they, they, they know all this mm. from experience. Maybe not that factory, but maybe that quality manager has 20 years of experience, has been going through uh, 50 uh, customer audits. They, they, they know what to say, what not to say, and what to prepare. And it sometimes it's really scripted, you know, they, um, which is why, a lot of buyers who come in without um, any kind of uh, guiding principles for a factory visit will tend to be bluffed. You know, they, they, they go in and they're like, yeah, I'm just going to see. And then, you know, like use my critical thinking as I go along. And basically, well, if you have worked in manufacturing, yeah, that's going to work. No problem. You know, um, if you've been doing quality audits for, for 10 years, yeah, it's going to work. It's fine. However, if, if you've been a purchaser in an office and you go to a factory, which is a totally foreign area for you, and you're going to walk along and you think that you're going to make, you know, try to make stuff up as, as you go and just, you know, um, come up with the right questions and put your finger where uh, things are really wrong. Uh, well, in many cases, it doesn't really work. So if you come and like that, and like, yeah, let's just follow the flow and show me what you do. And they'll be like, great, you know, here's a scripted visit for you. <laughs> and uh, just follow us and we're going to show you all the good stuff. And we're not going to show you all the stuff we don't want you to see. And, um, you know, that, that that doesn't work very well. So even if you, you, you're a buyer, you want to walk along, try to prepare some, um, some points to, uh, to look to, to dig into, let's say. And, and uh, I have like a list of, let me see, yeah, eight of them that I mm-hmm. usually tell buyers to, um, to, to, to follow because it really improves their ability to, um, to distinguish between a good factory and a bad factory, you know, basically. Sure. Well, uh, I think, you know, when when we're bringing it back to vetting a, a potential new supplier, I think that these eight points are going to be really useful for listeners to to hear. So, yeah, right. do you want to go through each of those one by one? Sure. So, yeah, I'm going to go with 
go through them and it doesn't really follow any clear logic, but you know, I'll, I'll just throw them um, as I go. So okay. f- first is, hey, so you guys, you know, you say you pay attention to quality, you know, you okay, show me your lab, show me your testing equipment. Okay. Mm. And then, um, you know, does it make sense? Uh, does it cover some of the, the most common kind of tests that would be expected on that kind of uh, product? Uh, is it for compliance? Is it for um, conformance to specs? Do they also have something about reliability? That's great. Um, you know, is, is, is it just cheap stuff uh, out of calibration, you know, and uh, that look like they've been here for 20 years? Or is it very well maintained? Because if quality is important, they're going to pay attention to the ter- their testing equipment, no doubt, right? So is it is it well maintained? Obviously, all within calibration. You can see it. You can always ask for the calibration sticker. You know, calibration or verification depends on the, the kind of equipment. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, and and of course, if they say, well, we send it to to a lab, then you say, okay, for every batch, or what do you do? And then if they say for every batch, yeah, then you say, okay, well. Uh, what about that one I see in the in the finished good warehouse, you know, or um, like do you have a list of your, uh, the warehouse usually has, has a list of the outgoing shipments. Okay, you, you pick one from last month and you say this one, uh, can you show me the, you know, because you say you do a, you do a test in, in an outside lab uh, every time. So you show me for this one, you know, it's kind of, um, uh, funny. I mean, in, in most cases, they would be like, "Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't really say every time this customer doesn't require it." You know, right? Um, number two would be the storage of the the components or the materials. Uh, if you walk around the, the 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 materials warehouse, is it uh, is it a mess? Can you find some stuff that has a lot of dust on it? Uh, some pieces, maybe metal pieces that get rusty, maybe some really old packaging materials that have yellowed over time. I mean, you see all these kind of things and you ask why, you know, what are you going to do with this? Are you, are you waiting for a customer that will accept that? I mean, come on, you know, um, this is not acceptable in a high quality uh, sort of manufacturer, right? And mm. of course, some materials absolutely require you know, humidity control, sometimes temperature control. Like if they store some batteries in a place that's, you know, 40 degrees, uh, it's not good. If they store, I don't know, acetate frame, uh, uh, sorry, acetate uh, kind of blocks somewhere without humidity control, without temperature control, and you see it actually bending, you know, it's not good. That doesn't work, right? These people don't care about quality. I mean, period, right? And, and um, it's often actually quite, uh, quite obvious. Um, another one, number three would be how, when they have some problems, quality, quality problems. So it could be non-conform raw materials, it could be in the production line, could be after production. How do they identify these non-conforming goods or materials? You know, in production, you can ask, okay, so if this operator finds a problem, you know, a defect, where are they going to put it? If they don't have something like a red box or an area, you know, that is clearly labeled, this is for NG goods, you know, non-conforming goods, not, not good. Uh, if, it's, if it's not clearly labeled, it means people are not really careful, careful about it and, and, and they don't really care, right? Mm. Um, they're just, just pushing for production, fast, fast, fast. They, they, they're not concerned about shipping some, some bad stuff to customers, right? This is the wrong attitude. Number four is you can always say, okay, so what kind of big issues did you have in the past year? You know, and if a factory says, well, no, you know, nothing, you know, everything is smooth, then come on, your biggest issue, you know, well, it's fine, you know, it means they're really not open because every manufacturing facility has issues. Um, big or small, usually they always have big, uh, relatively big or very big issues, right? So um, then once you get your finger on one or two issues like that, you say, okay, so what did you do about it? You know, 
corrective action plan? Uh, what, you know, root cause analysis, show me. Did you really go down to a root cause? Or did you just say, well, this guy made a mistake, we fired him, you know, no, sorry, this, <laughs> you did not fix it at the root cause. Right. Uh, this mm. is a joke, right? And this again is really a bad attitude, really bad behavior by the, the managers. Um, however, if they show, well, this is a very structured approach and it's been documented and you can see we went down to the root cause and we did this and we did that and we followed over time and we keep following up and we, we added a control here or even better, a way to detect it here or even better, um, we, we actually did a little change in the process uh, just to make sure it cannot even happen at all. You know, well, that's, that's, that's great. Um, number five would be the, the training and the instructions for the operators. If they don't even have work instructions, not very good. Um, mm -hmm. if, if, um, if they can't really explain how people are trained and like they have a, maybe a morning meeting every morning to put the finger on certain things and, you know, and did they, uh, they don't have any initiatives or anything that they, they never heard of 5S. I mean, you know, the, 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 the certain things that uh, really point to um, a factory that you can't really trust to do a good job. Yeah. Number six is they have a manufacturing process. Can they tell you what steps are critical? You know, where, you know, the, the, the very serious issues could originate from, let's say. That these are the critical steps. Um, you know, have they identified these steps in some way, in some manner? Have they done something um, special to reduce the risk that things go wrong in these process steps? Or did you just say, ah, it's fine, ah, never any problem, it's okay. You know, basically no preventive action at all. And of course you cannot trust that everything is always perfect. Um, you know, there's, there's always issues, right? If, if sure. they don't tell you about issues, it means they don't want to be transparent with you, basically. Uh, and that also tells you about your future relationship with them. They're not gonna be transparent at all. They're gonna try to, to push the, the ugly stuff under the carpet, right? Systematically. Mm. Uh, point seven, yeah, basically uh, look for anything preventive. Again, and this is related to the, the, the previous step. Um, any mistake proofing devices, for example, if I don't know, something dumb, you know, the dumb old example, but if they're drilling something, drilling hole into a part and then there's a way for them to, to put the part upside down, maybe in the fixture and then the, the hole is not properly uh, positioned, well, maybe they should change the fixture. They could maybe add a pin or something so that it's actually impossible to put the, 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 the part upside down in the, in the fixture can only be mm. processed if it's placed exactly the right, the right way, right? That, that's, that's a classic example of mistake proofing. There's so many other ways to, to do it, but look for ways to, to look for, um, sorry, examples of that. Uh, maintenance of the equipment, extremely important. Uh, except if they only do simple assembly. Now they only do simple assembly. Um, equipment might not be that important, even though they, they probably still have some testing equipment, might need some, um, some maintenance. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, and do they have a plan about preventive maintenance? Or do they just wait until basically things break? <laughs> <laughs> things go down and then they're going to do something about it. Well, guess what? In that case, it's going to impact both quality and efficiency. It's going to impact quality because uh, that piece of equipment, maybe before it goes down, if, if, before the tool, maybe that blade breaks or something, it, it, it might have produced bad, bad parts for four hours, right? Uh, maybe it kind of half broke and nobody noticed it and then it finally completely broke and then, you know, and maybe it damaged the, the, the a machine that cost a million RMB. Uh, so it hurts cost. 
it's going to hurt the, the schedule and also the, the, the production efficiencies, uh, obviously, because people have to stop and, and like, oh, okay, well, this is not according to production planning, you know, what do we do now and so on. People are going to be idle. It, it's just a disaster when mm. that kind of things happens. Um, statistical process control. Well, I know people are laughing. It's kind of, nobody does that in China. Nice. <laughs> um, however, when you have some fabrication uh, and again, critical process steps, you, you need to actually measure the output of, um, of these critical fabrication steps uh, and you know, plot them based on the tolerance to see uh, maybe your, your, the, the capability of these processes. Um, also, if you buy some specific um, components or consumables, and there's one or two properties that are extremely important, you know, really critical to quality, you also need to, to measure it in some way and, um, and, 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 and follow it up over time. And that's how you challenge your supplier. And an example was, for example, in a, in a factory that was making paint brushes, they were buying a lot of glue to glue these, um, um, you know, the, 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 basically the brush um, all together. I don't know how to call it, the hair of the brush or whatever. And yeah. then the, um, the, the, the glue sometimes was just coming apart after a few months. Well, okay, you know, the, you have to test the viscosity of the glue. That's, that was one thing. When they started to do it, and when this, they saw glue with really, uh, with viscosity way outside their tolerance, they would just send it back to the supplier and they would say, this is no good, give me a good batch, right? I mean, problem solved. And um, mm. a good way of putting pressure on the, um, on, on the supplier. Um, so, you know, um, you know the, 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 the calibration, is it done properly, nicely? For example, if they have, I don't know, maybe uh, an oven or a plastic injection uh, press or, you know, where do they put the, the gauge to check the heat? To just have one gauge, so you try to have several gauges to really see the homogeneity of of everything, and 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 then how you know do they just calibrate one of these gauges because they're a little bit lazy, or do they try to do everything? Mm. You know, this is the kind of of good, smart kind of um, preventive measures that are really a, a very good sign. So, oh, and number eight, nearly forget, but okay. Um, hey, maybe your product is really a product that they've been making for years and you're just going to slap your logo on it. Okay, fine. Then forget about this one. But if you've been developing a new product and that product is really new for them, and maybe it's got some customized parts going into it and then very probably the assembly itself and the testing are all new. There's no way it's going to be all perfect right away. So if you let them go into a batch of 20,000 pieces right out of the gate, who's going to suffer, you know? Chances mm. are, you know, everybody's going to suffer, including you, because they're gonna, they're gonna come back to you, they're gonna say, well, yeah, you know, it's kind of late, because um, that supplier did something wrong, and, uh, and it kind of delayed us, and his testing station is not ready, sorry about that, we're really hurrying up, and da 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 and then they're going to say, well, yeah, we're in assembly, but we see that it's actually much more complicated than we thought. And, and, uh, and then you're going to find that there's serious quality issues. And then they're going to also say, well, it's much more complicated and time consuming than we thought. So the price goes up 20%, right? So everybody's suffering. It's really not fun. <laughs> uh, you don't want that. So you, you, you can ask a simple question. Okay. Well, you're going to make 50, 50 pieces first after you've done the tooling, after, you know, basically when you have, when you're all ready for production, you're going to just make 50 pieces and we're going to check it. And if there are issues, you're going to do a second batch of 50 pieces until there's, you know, the, the main issues have been fixed and see what they say. Um, they say, whoa, no, we don't, you know, trust, trust us. It's fine. Um, 
oh, uh, oh maybe they're gonna say, well, um, yeah, okay, it's fine. You know, we're gonna make it in the sample room. Whoa, 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 no, 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 no. It has to be in the workshop uh, on the same equipment with the same people, the same uh, instructions and everything as mass production and look at their faces. And if they say, well, no, well, you know, you're gonna be in trouble uh, because they probably paid their staff by the piece and you know, they, they don't have good systems to, to, to have production people actually accept to do that. And, and it's just gonna, not gonna happen, right? And you're gonna go into production hell and that's really not going to be fun. So that's an easy question. <laughs> and, you know, just look at their reactions. So that, that's, right. that's my favorite, um, you know, top eight <laughs> kind of checkpoints. Yeah, th those are amazing. There's so much to think about there. And I, I really start to see, you know, that the, the, the value the factory order is going to bring when you're, when you're vetting new suppliers. Uh, a lot of these points, I think that they're perhaps likely to uncover things which are perhaps, shall we say, a little bit awkward for the potential supplier possibly awkward so with that being the case you as an importer who is looking at possibly working with this supplier if you talk to them about wanting to perform a factory audit sending in a, a an auditor to do a second party audit as you discussed earlier the likelihood is often they're probably not going to be super pleased about this right <laughs> well i mean if they really want your business and if you said from the very beginning that it would be part of the process and you know they might actually see that as a good thing mm. they're gonna say well they're gonna say okay it means we're moving forward in the sales process right in all other cases they're not gonna be happy <laughs> right. so maybe they're gonna say mm, okay you know but like what's the checklist and what's the audit plan and everything that should be vague. It's better not to give them a very precise kind of checklist and oh, I'm going to check this document and this document because they're going to focus on creating the right document, you know, the right uh, records and everything to make you happy, but then they're, mm. they're not going to work on actually setting up good systems and improving their processes. So that that's a problem. You know, some of them are going to say, well, um, we have some confidential um, productions, you know, these days, so we cannot accept an auditor, but you, you're welcome to come, of course, you are our customer, you know, uh, <laughs> which these days obviously is a joke, but well, yeah. um, it, it's a way of saying we don't want professional people to, uh, to come and, and, and really find our issues, it's better if you come, uh, because we, we, we think you don't know as much. <laughs> it's less dangerous, right? And um, some of them are going to say, well, well, you know, oh, that company, you know, oh, no, it's last time their auditor, you know, was asking for a lot of money from us and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and in some cases, that's true, but much less than people fantasize. So, you know, th there's a lot of things, a lot of objections that they can throw at it. Uh, but in general, if you say, hey, you want my business, you're going to have to go through the audit. Generally, they're going to say, okay, right? Uh, so that, okay. That's, that's not a huge issue, except if really okay. your, your orders are very small and you already you know, negotiated the price pretty bad and they, they're going to say, nah, you know what, get lost. Mm. <laughs> um, otherwise, it should be fine. Okay, good. Now, we've heard a lot of the really, really good effects that we can get from a factory audit. Are there any disadvantages or, or maybe blind spots that uh, the listener needs to know about from, a, from an audit? Well, you go to the production facility, typically that does sort of the last steps in the production process, right? Um, if you buy a company that makes, I don't know, bags, you, you, you know, they're not gonna make the zippers and they're not gonna make the, um, uh, the, the fabric generally and, and all of these, right? So you, you also, you, you're also going to rely on the suppliers making these. They are part of your supply chain, but you don't see them, right? Uh, and in some cases, what you really need to have in mind what the critical components are, 
right? Um, for example, I don't know, you, you're gonna buy uh, mobile phones. Well, there's some high value items such as the display and the battery and the, the, the processor and so on that you know, really uh, are gonna drive a lot of the, 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 the price, but also if they, if they malfunction some of the time, well, that, 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 that's gonna really come back and, and, and bite you uh, where you don't want. So mm. um, you might also want to have the critical component suppliers audited, but that um, then you run into another issue, which is supply chain transparency, which we highly advise. But again, you, know, you need to really do things right from the very beginning. Um, certain things are realistic, certain things are more difficult. That's, that's a whole other uh, topic. There's also undisclosed subcontracting. So it's, it's good to know that they can produce here and it's a good place, but what if that place gets very busy and there's this other place you know, down the road or maybe in another city, but usually not very far away, that's going to be much cheaper and but maybe is you know doesn't really have any structure in place and everything, and you have nobody on site to 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 go and follow up on that right um, subcontracting uh, behind your back so that's um, that's an issue and this typically is managed through inspections during production right mm -hmm. in some cases yeah the auditor most auditors let's say auditors of quality systems. Um, are, are not very technical. So they, if they've been working in an industry for a while, they will be um, familiar with the, the main processes. But if you hire someone who one day goes to a toy factory, then another day go to a shoe factory, and then the next day goes to a, um, uh, an electronics factory and so on, they, they, they can't really build all the experience that they need in these specific kind of categories. And it, it sure. becomes a little bit harder for them to uh, sort of ask the right questions and assess whether responses that are given um, make sense or not, right? Uh, I would mm. not say this is a major, major issue, but certain, at least the basics they have to know, you know, if they go to an electronic factory, they see that maybe the, the PCBAs are on, um, a tray and or even you know the cardboard or directly on the table is not um, ESD sensitive or that you know that uh, there's going to be elect uh, electrostatic um, electricity that might actually cause issues and cause some of the boards to um, to fail that that's a very common sort of um, a failure mode very well known in electronics and it's one of the basics if they don't know that uh, there's a problem, right? That, that's an example. That's an, just an example. Um, so, um, or I don't know, they go into a, uh, a garment factory and then they, you know, the checklist calls for um, traceability, you know, of the materials and so on. And if, if they don't think of asking about the leftovers of the, the fabric rolls and what happens to them, um, you know, they, they're skipping on something important, right? And um, and when when several rolls are, are used for the same uh, the same um, cut and sew batch, what happens and, and 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 so on, right? How how is it accounted for? So that this, this the, the, at least they need to know the basics. Now, if you really count on a supplier to provide engineering capabilities, do you know the the R&D and some of the new product introduction work, a lot of process engineering. Um, that's, I would say, another topic generally. Uh, it's mm. much better if the auditor is familiar with that and can, um, can gauge that, but that's, that's, you know, let's say less realistic, right? And we, we, we touched on that a few episodes ago about evaluating a, um, a manufacturer's capability of, you know, doing, engineering work to, to help develop mm -hmm. a new product. That's, that's really a, an entirely different topic, I would say. 
Right, but you're going to get a feel for whether the, the provider that you're speaking to, the, the audit provider, I mean, has a good feel for what you need and, and has a good understanding of what you're looking for when they're then going to go and, you know, use the checklist and, and be looking into the specifics of what's going to help you best. If you're not comfortable with that, I guess that then there is a chance that the audit might not exactly re return the results that you need. Right, so you need to be clear about exactly what you want the audit to do because again, there's, there's so many objectives and flavors and you, mm. you, you know, either you, you say, well, I want a, a proven sort of audit checklist and you know, I want it simple and cheap, okay. Or you say, well, no, I want, you know, I'm gonna go and do, you know, 20 audits this year and I, I, I'm gonna work on a, a solid checklist and I'm gonna, select a provider that's going to help me do that and really will fit our needs. That's a totally different approach, right? Mm. Okay. Well, that's a, an excellent introduction into doing second party factory audits and, and how an importer, especially perhaps if you're not so used to doing this sort of thing, uh, starts off the process, what the audit is going to be looking for for you, with the sorts of results that you can expect. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, don't forget to like and share. And you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other places that you get your podcasts from. See you next time.